Okay. So, I think we're good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this introduction to regenerative medicine. And so this is a very rapidly changing area. It was kind of amusing. In 2015, in February 2015, I, I went to the cutting edge of transplantation meeting. And on the day when they discussed regenerative medicine, everybody decided to cite C's. <laughs> there were only six people there. There were actually more presenters than audience. And it show, showed you how desperately unpopular regenerative medicine was in 2015, but by 2017, it, it, it was becoming more acceptable. And uh, so the Cell Therapy Regenerative Medicine Society was a full partner with the Canadian Society of Transplantation, the 2017 meeting. And my own meeting, the Banff Transplant Pathology meeting in 2019, um, we had major sessions devoted to regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. So it's like, there's no escape. <clears throat> and uh, as many of you, of you know, we've, we've been quite interested for many years in the Human Cell Atlas Project, single cell transcriptomics, which will revolutionize uh, pathology and medicine. Um, it not only tells you what kind of cell you're looking at, but what its lineage is and state of activation, a whole bunch of other things. Um, you can tell about individual cells. And what was unusual about the Human Cell Atlas was that it was promoted mainly on Facebook. And their initial funding was from the Chan Zuckerberg Fund, which is from Facebook. So if you were on Facebook, you knew everything about single cell transcriptomics. You were going to traditional meetings you knew nothing about. And it was as if there was a strong effort to keep single cell transcriptomics out of regular meetings because bulk transcriptomics taking a large piece of tissue and just getting the general transcript presence in the whole thing is an established technology that was obviously threatened by this single cell transcriptomics. And the politics of that were very interesting. Uh, when you looked at uh, the plenary session for the American Society of Nephrology meeting in 2018, in October 2018, there were four keynote speakers that were promoted everywhere, but they only promoted three of the topics. So why did four keynote speakers only have three topics? That's because they couldn't bring themselves to say the words uh, kidneys or, or human cell atlas, that that, that um, was not popular with the sponsors of the meeting. So anyway, uh, Ishita Mogi and I, um, she is a TA in this course. We went to that meeting and we met with the um, speaker talking about single cell transcriptomics. Uh, and then it was really significant moment. Um, so I think at this point, you, you can ask a big question about this course. Uh, <laughs> it's a simple question, really. You've all heard this phrase, those who can do and those who can't teach. So, is that true of this course? Are the people teaching you people who can't do but can teach? And I would say that that's really not true. Uh, Ishida teaches in this course, as do I. 
and our videos together have really changed things. Um, so there's another phrase you may have heard, those who can do and those who can't criticize. And I'm interested in critique. Uh, right now at the moment, we are short of, of people who are giving us criticism and it would be valuable to have more critique. That includes the feedback on this course. And uh, so you can be assured that we take um, lots of action on the suggestions that the students make in the course. So what things have we changed? So one thing is bringing together transplantation and regenerative medicine. These are two distinct areas of medicine that have a single future. Basically, transplant pathology is going to be, become tissue engineering pathology. And transplantation itself will be replaced by regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. Why is that? That is because transplantation only reaches 10% of people who need organs. And for a lot of reasons, it will be hard for it to ever do better than that. So um, whereas regenerative medicine and tissue engineering could provide enough organs for everybody who needs organs. Um, so you might ask, what else can Ashita do besides <laughs> do videos? And she's also very good at graphics. So this is an Ashita Mogi graphic showing the six big problems of the human race that we are proposing that AI and blockchain would save us from. So the idea of AI and blockchain saving humanity from itself, that's what depicted here, where um, artificial intelligence having solved protein folding, which Patrick Polarski talked about with great uh, Emotion last time, that's, that's really the high point of Patrick's lecture when he's talking about the excitement around protein folding in fall of 2020. And the excitement for me is very simple. Protein folding is by many orders of magnitude more complicated than the six things depicted here, nuclear war, climate emergency, COVID-19, uh, Male aggression, uh, colonialism, um, um, systemic racism, all those things are easier to understand. It doesn't mean easier to solve, but easier to understand than protein folding is. So the fact that AI solved protein folding means that AI could help us significantly solve these big problems of the human race. And there's an important question of whether we can demonstrate the basic goodness of human beings. Because if we can, when machines become smarter than us, they will support our being here and, and it'll be great because they'll make the world a good place for humans. And if we can't show this basic goodness of human beings, that won't happen. <laughs> Sentient machines will simply ignore us, which wouldn't be a good thing. So the next Ishida Mogi graphic shows you this idea of the basic goodness of human beings. And even though it's silhouettes, it's a lot of depth in the thought behind this graphic having to do with people working together and children and adults and, and uh, aliens. Yeah, the whole thing and rain and umbrellas all, all in one great, Graphic. In a recent faculty meeting in uh, lab medicine pathology, I got there early and showed this graphic and the conversation that ensued almost <laughs> overtook the staff meeting. So, so it was really cool to see, see that happen. All right. And so one simple way to think about the people teaching you in this course is they are the people de depicted 
in this particular statement, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. Yeah, anyway, that's us, or maybe it is. So back to regenerative medicine. Um, regenerative medicine, there are various words you can use to describe it, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, and cell therapy. This graphic shows the popularity of those three terms, but they are often used interchangeably. And as I said, current transplant protocols reach fewer than 10% of those people who need an organ. And it's very complicated, the reasons for that, but it looks like no matter what you do, you could never ever with transplantation meet the overall need. Whereas with regenerative medicine, you could. And so that is a strong reason. So worldwide, the 1.4 million people in need of transplantation for end-stage organ failure, current transplant um, protocols reach fewer than 10%. So um, regenerative medicine could save the remaining 90% or over 1 million people annually. Uh, the number of transplants is increasing. Let's see if I can figure out. And uh, regenerative medicine is already here and to some extent already at the University of Alberta. The Viasite trial is partially headquartered here and Dr. James Shapiro from our staff is a lead investigator um, in that trial. So that's just a, a sort of local flavor of uh, regenerative medicine here. The other local flavor of regenerative medicine here is Timothy Caulfield, who is in health law. And he is not only a near celebrity in the sense that he's a very well-known person, but he is also an expert on being a celebrity. And he has uh, books, like is Gwyneth Paltrow wrong about everything? <laughs> so a very interesting guy. And then what am I doing? You know, I started the Banff classification 30 years ago. We are also planning a new Banff classification of tissue engineering pathology. And that's part of what I will be talking about in this lecture. So the Health Law Institute is very interesting. I'm just gonna quickly take you through some of their publications, but you can see they have uh, very sexy names. <laughs> like From Kim Kardashian to Dr. Oz, the future relevance of popular culture and our health and health policy, et cetera. So yeah, a lot of that kind of thing. And if you ever wondered whether um, celebrity and, and hype impacts medicine, it certainly does. And uh, um, this is, is the unit providing the best data for that in the entire world. Um, yeah, so stem cell hype is a real thing. And um, so I, I want you to know that the impact of um, regenerative medicine is sort of both good and bad. And, and that's a kind of hard thing to figure out. But in the regulatory area, like Health Protection Canada and the FDA, their biggest problem is preventing people from being harmed by clinics making fraudulent claims about uh, regenerative medicine and stem cell uh, therapies. Um, so, I, in a sense, uh, regenerative medicine 
Um, is the big hope for the future of medicine. But there, there, there are uh, tremendous problems with stem cell hype, where either well-meaning people are over-promising what regenerative medicine can do, stem cell fraud, and, but there is real hope that, that uh, regenerative medicine will make medicine much more capable of, of solving the world's health problems than it is right now. So I kid uh, nephrologists by telling them and renal pathologists, they may be the only people still employed in 2045 that when robots have taken over all the other jobs that uh, this area of <laughs> figure out who needs a stem cell created organ and what kind of organ they should have. It's just complicated enough that we're still gonna need people for a while there. Yeah, so th this is the BAMP classification of kidney transplant pathology. It's the thing I'm known the most for. Um, I came to develop this course because I've been generating consensus worldwide uh, for 30 years and you can't do that without technology. So it made me more and more interested every year in uh, technology and the future of medicine. So you may wonder, uh, what is the real essence of the BAMP classification? Not just what does the guy who started it think of it, but what do other people think of it? So um, Ben Adam, who is our youngest um, kidney pathologist, uh, says that use of the BAMP lesion scoring is sign of an educated transplant pathologist and it gives the imprimatur uh, uh, that you know what you're doing in transplant pathology. So that's his impression of it. And, and the milestones over the past 30 years are shown here. Um, my uh, uh, career in, in pathology has been heavily influenced by this. Those of you who know the uh, buddy bench up in our hallway in, in uh, the fifth floor of the hospital, it's a lot of Simpsons theming there. And that is because the timing of the Simpsons TV show and of the Banff classification are almost exactly the same. They started at the same time. And there are various graphs of how the quality of the Simpsons uh, TV program is going, and I guess the band's classification is doing better than <laughs> TV program, but they do have a similar time course. And that, that's the reason we have all that Simpsons themed stuff up on the buddy bench outside my office. Yeah, there are still lots of publications uh, being produced. The best journal in transplantation, the American Journal of Transplantation, their uh, citation classics are almost all articles about uh, BAMF uh, uh, material and BAMF meeting reports. So there's a strong um, tie or link between high quality scientific uh, publications in transplantation and the BAMP meeting. Yeah, so, so we plan to add tissue engineering pathology soon. And this is the BAMP process, the way the consensus works. You may wonder about expert run consensus. If lives are at stake, <laughs> you know, like if you're choosing like who to allow to use the lifeboat because the main boat's sinking or something, 
then ha having an expert make those decisions is probably not working very well. But in this case, it's really not life and death. And so I've, I've been generating consensus here um, for 30 years, and it's working pretty well. It has to be humble leadership. If somebody else starts to describe an idea better than the idea you had, you have to be willing to let people go with that better, more popular idea and not have the idea that it's my way or the highway. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not capable of, of producing expert-led consensus. Yeah, so these are some pictures from the BAMP classification over the years. I've speculated it will be forever, who knows? Uh, yeah, so the world is changing rapidly. When this cover appeared on the American Journal of Transplantation about building new hearts, a lot of people who were looking at that cover thought they wouldn't see such a thing in their lifetime. So it, it, it is clear that it's moving faster than a lot of people thought it would. Um, yeah, and, and so the idea of scaffolds, bioactive factors, tissue engineered constructs, when you think of the future of medicine, you need to be thinking of these sorts of things. And a lot of my promotional activities are sort of a, to, to, to get people moving on this. I don't know if, if there's a better metaphor than jump-starting. Someday it will be something other than jump-starting, but right now it feels like jump-starting is the, the thing that, that we need. And how do Canadians feel about this? Canadian data on public interest in regenerative medicine indicates uh, that Canadians have broad support for radical life extension resulting from advances in regenerative medicine. How about that, eh? And in a sense, this is the technological singularity in medicine. In my first and second lecture, we talked about technological singularity in general, but when regenerative medicine is widely used and successful, that will really produce dramatic changes throughout medicine. And so how do things work now? This is an animal model of uh, taking a decellularized kidney and then reintroducing cells into it. And some strange things happen. So podocytes, which are specialized cells that are ordinarily only found in the glomeruli, you find them in the interstitium in this reconstituted kidney. And so it becomes a question then, how close to a normal kidney does a stem cell generated kidney need to be in order to be capable of being used? And that's the kind of question that um, the BAMP classification of tissue engineering pathology will eventually be able to answer. And we look forward to that. You may feel that this lecture doesn't have much to do with you, <laughs> but argue you're wrong about that. If you have any nostalgia again, uh, about subjects you've learned in the past that you think are of zero value now, you may be amused to know that the considerations surrounding functioning of the stem cell generated kidney brings a lot of sort of old fashioned ideas back to life. So you may find that things that you learned at the beginning of your training that you thought had zero value now are useful again in considering how a stem cell generated organ works. Um, yeah. So, uh, Many problems with stem cell generated organs are not being discussed. You could help us more widely discuss 
those problems. Um, many old fashioned questions about uh, physiology um, relate to how stem cell generated organs would work. Um, it's not just true for the kidney, it's true for every organ. Yeah, so the Banff Foundation for Allograph Pathology and the Banff meetings must adapt to future changes in the field of transplantation. So we will eventually be regenerative medicine and stem cell generated organ focused. Um, somebody needs to create those disciplines and it will be us, yeah. Um, so for instance, these are really old terms. Intact nephron hypothesis, the stunned myocardium contraction band necrosis. These are things that a lot of physicians learned and currently think are of zero value to them. But actually when you look at how stem cell generated heart or kidney works, these ideas come back again. So it's kind of interesting how to decide what things you were forced to learn are of zero value. It's, it's a little bit hard to figure out. You may be surprised. So the classification is on sustaining life. In other words, okay, we, we have this stem cell generated kidney. It would provide some function it has some cells in the wrong place, doesn't have enough of some kinds of cells, has too many of other kinds of cells. So is it gonna provide net benefit to the patient? Is it better than not having anything? And so those are the kinds of questions that the BAM classification of tissue and engineering pathology will answer. And uh, so, when you look at the detailed histological um, uh, findings in stem cell generated organs, some parts of them are pretty strange. So for instance, you can say, can you really call this a kidney? <laughs> yes, you can call it a kidney. It has glomeruli, tubules, and interstitial vessels, just like a, a normal kidney. It's just, they look a little strange. The tubule is not just a simple tubule, but has many in connect, interconnecting compartments and so on. It's a bit strange. That doesn't mean it wouldn't work. Maybe it would work. Yeah. So the focus of tissue engineering pathology would shift from the current focus of transplant pathology to, you know, is this organ rejecting, or if not, what else is wrong with it, would shift to the question, is this organ structurally intact enough to function safely and adequately in the recipient? Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about Corey Fung vis-a-vis -vis your current situation as a student. You're a student, you probably have some unknown talents People sitting on either side of you have no idea you have these special talents, but you may have them. So at a certain moment, I needed somebody on this uh, tissue engineering pathology paper to provide graphics that would be the draft of what the artist would finally produce. And Corey Fung was a student working with me and he raised his hand, which <laughs> who has artistic skill. He's the only one raising his hand. So he ended up doing the graphics. And as luck would have it, those pencil sketches of Corey Fung's became the final art. It's kind of hard to explain how that happened. It wasn't what we, we intended. And looking back at whether we can change it now, we, we can't. Not only is it the final art, but it is going to be the final art. We, we may eventually have professionally drawn pictures of those things, but they're not going to be associated with that particular article from 2018 that has Corey's pencil sketches. And I think it's, it's kind of cool. So when, when you think of you know, being associated 
with Kim Solon's projects, what can the outcome be, right? Can have some unexpectedly positive things. Another aspect of that, which I would just mention at this point, is the exchange with uh, Le Mans France, with uh, my um, video legacy um, cohort there. So a, a lady nephrologist whose name is Georgina Piccoli. So the idea behind that uh, student exchange is students from here go there for the summer and do kidney medicine research with her. She is also an artist. She's done a recent Alice in Wonderland um, art show, and we have copies of her art. And if you go to my office, you'll find that right now, as I'm speaking, that medical student Stephanie Carlin is up there putting these um, Alice in Wonderland illustrations on the walls of my office. And uh, yeah, so that's where you can see them. Um, so you could spend a summer with her and who else is doing that? Ishita Mogi is already planning to go. So you would be going with her and uh, yeah. So it's just something to think about as an unusual aspect of doing stuff with me. Yeah, more Corey Fung art. Okay. So the focus of tissue engineering pathology, um, the specific questions become things like, is there too much endothelial disruption for the organ to be properly perfused? What are the risks of tumor formation of cancer? Um, yeah, so the classification categories should not be one-off, but reproducible and generalizable. Tissue engineering pathology has been up until now really dull, since most reports were of scaffolds with no inflammatory reaction, kind of move along, nothing to see here, pathology. But from today, maybe they'll become really exciting with novel morphologic changes and lives hanging in the balance of people being saved by these regenerative medicine generated organs. This mention brings me to mention something else that is a kind of spinoff of this course. As I said before, for some students, it's just an ordinary course. And when they finish it, they go on to other things, but other students get sort of hooked. <laughs> Want to keep on doing things related to the course and are not happy with the long space and time between the fall course and the winter course. So we created the future and all that jazz, uh, which is taking important subjects in science that you might not enjoy listening to a lecture on, putting them in poetry and music to engage the community around those important issues. And for a long time, we were doing that all over the world, but not here. But then in uh, January 2019, we did it right here at the U of A. It was a big success. You can watch the videos from that. So that's something else you could potentially be a part of in some way. Yeah, just interesting to think about what we're doing there. It really wasn't comedy because it turns out comedy is, is not a terribly efficient way to promote science, but I think art is. So we're really doing it pretty much as art without comedy, yeah. And then uh, the question of whether everybody needs our help promoting stuff. And we were quite impressed that Aviv Regev is quite, self-sufficient doing her own promotion of the Human Cell Atlas project. And I think she's doing that very well and she probably doesn't need us to help her, uh, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting to you know, discuss uh, science promotion with her because uh, 
both parties, you know, Ashita and I, I have, have, have been devoting a lot of time and effort to science promotion, and so has the Regev in somewhat different ways. Yeah, this then is the last slide. Oh my goodness. And so in our original location for the BAMP classification, we have mule deer poking their heads into the meeting rooms. Now we're much more high tech than that. So we've, we've, we've come a long way. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize for giving such a short lecture, but it means we have a long time for discussion. And let me tell you about next time, whether you found this lecture exciting or not or whatever, but next time is going to be even more exciting because the part two lecture is asking when is the Wild West period of regenerative medicine going to end? And what I mean by that is that it, 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 it's really not mainstream in medicine and transplantation went through a similar period where it was dangerous, most people died, you know, it, it just wasn't working very well. And around the time that I got directly involved, like in the 1980s, I, I was part of, of um, trials of cyclosporin, which was kind of the big anti-rejection agent that changed everything that made uh, transplantation safe. And so from that point onward, it became a practical therapy. So what we're asking in the next lecture is when is that becoming a practical therapy thing going to happen with regenerative medicine? And you may say, oh, but are we gonna have old tired Dr. Solis doing the only lecturing? No, <laughs> because there is a young woman um, who is joining us, Askik Petrosyan is her name. And she is one of the brightest young people working on regenerative medicine in the kidney. She's gonna tell you all sorts of exciting stuff about uh, glomerulus on a chip and stuff like that, of how you can combine um, uh, te technology and regenerative medicine. So that's what you have to look forward to next Tuesday. Uh, she's looking forward to it as am I. And you may wonder, <laughs> like me, I don't think this is very important what I'm about to say, but you may wonder like, do I have a leadership role or, or yeah. So I am the chair of the Transplant Regenerative Medicine Community of Practice within the American Society of Transplantation. And that's kind of a big deal as a sort of policy setting thing. And I'm looking to uh, find other people to join us in the, in the executive of that. And it won't surprise you where, where I'm looking. There's a trainee category. And so I'm looking sort of build things up from the trainee category because I'm sort of young person oriented, as you may have noticed. So young people are sort of my solution to everything. And it's not a bad theory. It's probably not a practical solution to everything, but it's, it's, a, it's a good solution for most things. Yeah, so anyway. Okay, so let me unshare and uh, see what questions you might have. Also, you may wonder about the indentured servitude of the course. When we finish a lecture early, do we have to go all the way to 320 no matter what? And the answer is no, that, that if, if we're done earlier, we can be done earlier. How, how about that? So yeah, so I don't want to feel that we, 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 we have to have the longest discussion ever but we should have whatever discussion you would like to have. So it's kind of an unusual day. There are lots of people on Zoom. Um, 
Yeah, there are 11 people on Zoom. There are two students in the room. And, and, and so, yeah. Uh, so there, there are fewer students than we've ever, in the room than we've ever had. Yeah, so the one thing you can be sure of is we're not a danger to each other. Like we are socially separ separated. Yeah, like you wouldn't, wouldn't believe so. Yeah, even if a virus wanted to hop from one of us to, to, to another, it would have great difficulty, yeah. So anyway, that, that's the state of the room today. Okay, any questions, comments, uh, critique, you know? Yeah, so I, I should say, and, and it, you, you may find this amusing, I'm applying for a CIFAR grant. Uh, the theme is the future being human. You would recognize that is too general a title for most people. They, 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 they can't really generate. And, and, and it's not a project, it's a program. The only way you can succeed is to create something gigantic that is a future program for CIFAR. They're not interested in individual projects. So as far as I know, I'm the only one who advanced to the next stage of this CIFAR grant here at the U, U of A. And the problem with that is that people are treating me with great deference and respect and, you know, being very polite. And, all this. and there's been no criticism of my grant text whatsoever, which makes it very hard to keep working on it. <laughs> I'm not getting any negative feedback on anything. So yeah, so may, maybe one or more of you would like to dig in and, and give us a critique. Yeah, you don't have to do that, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I, <laughs> it's not the situation I expected to be in. If you think back to, to Ashita and, and me doing those videos in January, 2018, we expected to be ignored. We expected nobody to make the changes we were suggesting. So this whole thing between then and now is kind of, kind of turning out exactly the opposite from what I thought. But it has benefit to you, you guys, that that is that is the case. You know that 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 the things we complained about have been corrected, and that gives credence to the idea that as we propose these big things in the CIFAR grant, that we could also influence people to do those things similar to what we have already done. Okay, enough about me. So what about you guys? What, what questions do you have? Comments? Anything? I need some words from somebody out there. Yes, okay. So is that on? Is it on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's not really a question, but I noticed in one of your slides, you mentioned about um, like organ trafficking. So would regenerative medicine like help prevent that or would there be other ethical issues that would arise with regenerative medicine? Well, I think organ trafficking, organ, trafficking, the profit in it comes from the scarcity of organs, right? So the problem of organ trafficking will go away when, when, when we have enough organs for everyone. Um, yeah, so that would be wonderful. Um, it, it's a very complicated area ethically. You just ask yourself some questions. Like, for instance, in transplantation, as you know it today, should people be allowed to buy organs? Can they pay money for organs? Maybe not, okay. Can you compensate the donor's costs? Like the donor takes time off work and you know has a surgical operation for a living related donor, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of things and, and you'll find yourself 
in in an area where you really don't know the answer or you and your best friend don't you know agree on on the answer it's a very complicated thing um and when when you try to think about the future simply we're definitely dealing with a hybrid future where the improvements will come from you know everything you can think of will come from the success of xenographs. So ha having organs from pigs and other animals like humanized pigs, it, 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 it will come from regenerative medicine, will come from improvements in organ uh, donation from humans. Um, to tolerance, we'll learn more about uh, tolerance. It's sort of mysterious at the moment, but we're learning more year by year. Yeah, so all those things will improve the availability of, of organs with end stage organ failure. Other questions? Um, I have a rather simple question. Um, how long does it take to generate one of these kind of ghost organs, thinking on an, like say an industrial scale to provide uh, necessary organs? How quickly can it be accomplished? I, I, I think it's, it's pretty quick. Um, let's take, um, you know, a, a a pig model, pig kidney is about the same size as human kidney. And so you would use detergent to flush out the cells, leaving you the collagen substrate and, and a lot of the uh, mediators and so on that are there. You'd want to replace some of the mediators. Then, yeah, so um, creating a decellularized organ is quite quick. Um, then reseeding it, uh, there, there are all sorts of scenarios there, but to a certain extent, depending upon how you do it, you want, may want the cells to mature and so on. So it could be days to weeks before that happens, or maybe you would have solved some of the problems there and, and could do it much more quickly. So maybe it would be like one day or, or two to go from the empty de decellularized scaffold to have a full, fully recellularized organ. And as far as we know, there's no way to get every cell in the right place, but you probably don't need everything. Um, so for instance, in the, in, in the kidney, you're mainly dealing with the uh, excretory function. What about uh, being able to concentrate the urine? And what about uh, generating erythropoietin and, and so on? A lot of people argue that you could deal with a kidney that can excrete waste but cannot concentrate the urine there, there'll be other ways to, to work with that. And, and you wouldn't need a kidney that makes you know, erythropoietin. It's just kind of an accident that that's what the kidney does. You could you know, give uh, synthetic erythropoietin or you, you, you could have the cells that make it in some other organ of the body. Um, yeah, that, that's sort of a complicated answer, but that's, that's the answer as, as I know it, yeah. Yeah, could I add, add this is may, maybe a comical question, but I, I, I'm, I'm serious about it. So, you know, uh, Samadhi, um, the, the best thumbnail from the last video was one of her. And I'm, I'm sure that came as a kind of surprise, right? Is it? Oh no, that's, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you are the current thumbnail. Um, so I, and, 
And I think that's probably okay, but I, I wanted you to be aware of it, that, that we're making you instantly famous in this way. Um, and, and, but that doesn't have, have to be the case. So as you probably know, YouTube automatically generates three um, thumbnails. One of uh, Patrick is sort of unappealing. So I could go through and sort of um, by doing screen captures, find a much better one than, than the, yeah. So, so, so anyway, think about it, but if you're not comfortable being the thumbnail for, for the last teaching sessions. Uh, I think I'm okay, it's fine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, and, and th so this accidental uh, celebrity can happen to you. I mean, all of you, it, it's, it's, it's possible, just kind of an accident of, you know, wh whether you're in, in the video stream. I don't think the, that a human being makes that decision. I think it's automated on the YouTube side. A human being checks it, but I, I think the actual three images are, are chosen completely by algorithm. So it doesn't mean that a human being has a thing about you, Smatty. It means that an algorithm really likes you. And I, I don't know if that's better or worse than if it was, <laughs> was a human being. It's but, fine. <laughs> just wanted you to know, yeah. And it ha has to do with th things like, you know, the quality of your smile and like high cheekbones and stuff like that, I think. But we'll never really know all the things that factor into YouTube's choice of thumbnails. Yeah. Okay, back to serious stuff. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I just had a yeah. follow up to the answer you gave previously. Um, I was just wondering, so with a, uh, engineered tissue, um, would that still be able to produce erythropoietin? And if not, would the liver compensate to make the necessary amount or would you still need to supplement uh, exogenously? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, 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 there's another side to this. Those of you who are, who are into sports and know about like sports doping and so on, would know that uh, erythropoietin use in normal individuals to make you able to perform better at sports uh, competitions is a really big thing. And there is also um, a lot of promotion of uh, erythropoietin use in patients with chronic renal failure, it's not clear that the cutoffs are entirely determined by really what the people need as opposed to some sort of compromise <laughs> between providing, you know, erythropoietin to every kidney patient on the planet, which would maximize the profit to the company selling it, you know, and, and uh, optimizing well-being but yeah, so, so the whole thing's complicated by that. The science of um, providing uh, synthetic erythropoietin to patients is maybe a bit too good. You know, we, 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 we don't need quite the, 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 the high tech to do that that we actually have. So what I'm saying is a kidney that cannot produce erythropoietin would be such a boondoggle to the company selling these erythropoietin products. It's kind of like a marriage, marriage made in heaven, right? So, yeah. So- Yeah, so I guess it would be definitely a case by case basis, but- Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess I was just curious if, um, you know, if, you know, the main source of production of erythropoietin like the kidneys is non-functional if if the liver compensates accordingly or if like the liver can only produce that minimal amount that it does but well yeah it 
it's complicated. There are multiple factors, right? Renal erythropoietic factor, you know, erythropoietin itself, and so on. Um, yeah, and it, it's it's a regulated thing. Um, Might be too much of a biochemical question, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's okay. it, it's a it's a question that ha has an answer. I just don't know the answer. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, yeah. yeah. It, and it I just had a quick, yeah. another quick one too. Um, so I was just wondering, like, um, in the same way that kidney transplant patients or any transplant patient has to receive like a regimen of anticoagulants, would uh, a patient receiving a artificial, I guess, artificially produced biocompatible tissue also need to follow that same regimen or would it be shorter or longer or how would that well, yeah. See, that that's the problem at the moment that repavementing the endothelium on the large blood vessels seems to be one of the hardest things to do. That, um, you know, you, you can replace the cells inside the organ and then have such a thrombogenic surface where the endothelium is all gone and the blood is uh, in direct contact with the collagen underneath the endothelium. And so the main artery and vein just clot like mad, you know, and, and it's such a shame when the, the rest of things are, are so perfect. Yeah, so, so, but that is also a solvable problem. And I think in, in maybe a year or two, everybody will know exactly how to make those large uh, vessel endothelial um, covering be just perfect. It's just hard at the moment. Yeah. And maybe it might be a dumb question, but like if, uh, like if you could take the stem cells from the patient who needs the transplant, I mean, that would also improve the biocompatibility as well, right? If you could do that or... Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's all it's all a good deal more complicated than you might think. Yeah, no, definitely. But, yeah. but um, one thing is that it it's probably not going to be possible to use the patient's own cells to to um, make transplanted organs in, in quantity. I mean, it, it's certainly possible in theory and so on, but what, what might be easier is sort of off the shelf uh, kidneys using somebody else's cells that are actually um, uh, you know, compatible with, with the recipient. So there might be minor incompatibilities. So there might be still some use of uh, immunosuppressive agents, but just not in, in, in as high doses as we need now. And in a way that's, that's good because a lot of the funding of um, transplantation currently is from pharma companies making immunosuppressive agents. So if you just stopped the need for it entirely. So, so no transplantation ever needed that anymore. It'd be kind of bad for those companies. So I think there'll, there'll be some sort of winding down process where mi some minimal immunosuppression would probably be needed, e even for things that, that are sort of like, uh, um, you know, completely compatible graphs, but maybe not absolutely 100% compatible. Oh, hello. I have a comment to make. So yeah. I am looking at this paper um, published in the Journal of Surgical Case Reports. And apparently there was someone in Brazil who was used like a tilapia skin as a xenograph for partial thickness burns, which uh, if you don't know, tilapia is a kind of fish. Right. So they used like fish skin to like cover his arm and stuff. And then it apparently worked really well. Like no dressing changes were needed and no side effects were observed. 
um, and there was complete re-epithelialization between within 12 and 17 days of treatment. Uh, cool. So yeah, yeah, I think that's really cool and also kind of really unexpected because I it's very hard to get people to accept, you know, organs, right? Um, right. And sometimes they'll have uh, like a, an allergic reaction basically to it and reject the organ, but uh, some skin from a completely different species like somehow works. Yeah, it's like well, no, there, there, there are gonna be a lot of uh, surprises along the way. And I don't want to give you the impression that regenerative medicine isn't mainstream now. It is to some extent for skin and bone. It's just, yeah, skin, bone and uh, cartilage. It's, it's pretty much mainstream right now. So, um, and, and in, uh, you know, orthopedic surgery and, and in the care of uh, patients with burns and other kind of skin wounds, it, it, it is fairly uh, routinely used. So those are sort of the simplest organs, right? And like complex organs, if you compare the liver and the kidney, the liver, you could argue, if you mix up the cells, but keep them alive, they'll still do useful stuff because the sequence of, of which cell you encounter first isn't particularly important in the liver. Whereas in the kidney, everything is sort of serial, like the, 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 the tubular system, so one kind of cells and then goes down into the hypertonic medulla and then back up and all that kind of thing. So, so the kidney is sort of the moonshot for that reason that uh, you really need cells in the right sequence and different kinds of cells in different places. And so and single cell transcriptomics is identifying a lot of new cell types we didn't know were there before. So we have postulated that in most organs, it will double the number of cell types and we'll have much better understanding how the organ actually works. Like for a long time, the kidney has been regarded as having 26 cell types, period, that's it. And now, now we're thinking it would probably be approximately 52 cell types, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's three ten. So uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed to let you go ten minutes early if that's what you want. On the other hand, if there are other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So there will be things that I've said today that are a bit easier for those of you with a medical background than those that don't have it, but. You can be assured that on the exam, there'll be nothing that requires a medical background. So, and you need some lectures in this course with medical terms, because within that, if we didn't have that, the Faculty of Science advisors would consider the course to be too easy. So you need <laughs> at least some lectures with medical terms. Otherwise, your, your advisors will think you're just taking this super easy, fluffy course, right? <laughs> so you don't want that. Yeah. Any other questions? So thanks for joining us today. We sort of set up in record time. I, I was the only one in the room for a very long time. And, and I even thought I'd entered an alternative reality because there's no one on Zoom and no one in the room. And I thought, Wow, yeah, so, yeah. But anyway, you, you all showed up. Thanks for doing that. And uh, yeah, um, okay. So we'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you very thank you. much. Yeah. Yes, sure. thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.